the Old Chairmanship and the great honour as well to speak on what I consider to be a very, very important issue. Um, this debate has been informed by a visit I had during recess week to both Barton Moss Secure Children's Home and Hindley Young Offender Institution. And I would like to take this opportunity at the start of the debate to pay full some tribute to the work that they do and the very obvious dedication and indeed humanity of all the stuff I met in both institutions. At the same time, I will actually pay tribute to the Prison Reform Trust who have been most useful in helping me think through some of what I intend to say today. They have been invaluable. And I think it's fair to say that there are few areas of public policy where the research is more voluminous, more detailed, more comprehensive than uh, that of youth justice. Um, there is always one more report that could be read, one more document that could be studied in detail, one more set of figures. I welcome the fact that the coalition government and indeed the other, the opposition party, the Labour Party, have all stressed their commitment to the principles of early intervention, the foundation years from naught to five. That's extremely welcome. But I do have a concern that there is a cohort of young people out there who are already on the conveyor belt to crime, as it was termed. In my preparation for this debate, I was pleased to go back and read the Honourable Member for West Dorset pamphlet he issued in 2002 that first set out the principles of this idea of a conveyor belt to crime. And uh, as someone who worked in the Conservative Research Department at that particular time, it uh, is a useful reminder that they weren't quite the wilderness years they often felt like during those years. But what that pamphlet indicated to me is that it isn't just at five that the conveyor belt stops. It runs right through into the age of 17. And whilst much good work is occurring in the field of early intervention, stopping children stepping onto that conveyor belt to crime, we do have to recognise that it's a significant policy challenge of what I would almost call a lost generation, aged between 4 and 17, who are maybe already on that potential conveyor belt, and for whom the benefits of Sure Start, Family Nurse Partnerships and everything else have already been missed. And indeed, it was stressed to me at Barton Moss Secure Children's Home that the age group 4 to 10 were particularly important for policy makers to grapple with. There is a concentration on the foundation years and then around the age group between 15 to 18. And not a great deal always happens in between. And that, you know, I would urge both government and indeed the wider think tanks out there to address the issue of the 4 to 10 age group. Now, whenever you discuss criminal justice, there are big questions that need to be asked. What is the criminal justice system for? What is the relative balance between punishment and rehabilitation? And perhaps, crucially, where is the victim in all of this? And whilst it may be tempting to embark on a great philosophical exposition of criminal justice this morning, I would like to focus on a slightly narrower field of play, perhaps, with issues around shorter sentences as a starting point. It struck me when one of the professionals I met the week before last said to me, well, at least if they are in for eight weeks, we can sort their teeth out. Yeah. Now, that might seem a slightly odd thing to say. Surely the principle of incarceration is not to address issues of oral hygiene. But it was actually a much more fundamental point than that, that because many of these people who enter the youth justice system have had very chaotic lifestyles. Many have not seen a dentist at all. Many have not engaged with health services. Many will have dropped out of the education system. And even a short sentence can offer a brief opportunity to address some of those underlying problems. Indeed, it could be argued that for many in the youth justice system, there is what you might call a perfect storm occurring. If I may just read out a litany of statistics from the Prison Reform Trust. Of those in the criminal justice system, 76% had an absent father, 51% came from deprived households, 39% had appeared on the child protection register, 28% had witnessed domestic violence, 14% had a parent with a physical, mental health or learning disability, 48% had been excluded from school, 31% were engaged in substance use, 20% had um, engaged in self-harm, 17% had a formal mental health diagnosis, and 11% had attempted suicide. Now, why do I read this litany out? 
not merely to emphasise the relative disadvantage those in the youth justice system face, but I think a more fundamental and frightening point, which is that the structure of our youth justice system seems to make it more likely that the most troubled in our society will be given custodial sentences because it is felt that their needs are far too complex to be dealt with in the community. Mm. Certainly. May I congratulate my honourable friend for securing this important debate. Does my honourable friend share my concerns that some young people suffering from Asperger's who are going into um, centres are not necessarily getting the treatment diagnosis they need and they're just being put down as mischievous, bad behaviour, trouble causes, when in fact the root of it is Asperger's? Maynard. I thank the, the Honourable Member for that contribution. He anticipates much of my later speech. I think it is certainly the case that we lack a fundamental understanding or a fundamental ability to assess young offenders when they enter the youth justice system as to what their needs are and how they can best be addressed. And they therefore end up in the secure estate without being assessed properly because the tools are simply not yet there present in the system. That's a great worry which I will come on to later. Um, the conveyor belt it would appear is constructed almost to minimise effective exit points until we reach the secure estate. And that should be a great concern because in both the courts and in custody, the disadvantaged children I referred to earlier face particular problems. It goes without saying that reoffending by juvenile offenders is extremely high. 75% of those released from custody, 68% of those who are given community sentences or other disposals in the community reoffend within a year. And why is this? <coughs> Undoubtedly, some of them will commit crimes. Some of them will be bad people. But for a significant number, the ineffective screening process currently in place, the lack of appropriate tools to identify behavioural and communication difficulties almost sets them up to fail. For example, I welcome the amendments the Minister is proposing to the 1976 Bail Act to remove the option of remand for young people who would be unlikely to receive a custodial sentence. But I would welcome an assurance from him that the alternatives will adequately protect vulnerable children. It would struck me once again when I visited Barton Moss Secure Children's Home that many children are remanded on bail to the Secure Children's Home for their own protection, for their own welfare, even though they might not end up receiving a custodial sentence. That there must be no presumption against a custodial remand. Equally, when they reach the youth court, they find disadvantage once again. There is little screening for young offenders for mental illness, learning disability, speech, language and communication difficulties. It is no use imposing a disposal of any sort if that punishment cannot be comprehended if they cannot interpret what is occurring to them in what can be a very off-putting setting. I admit I never visited a youth court, I can, but I can only imagine the feelings of a nervous child entering that very formal situation, uncertain of the process, uncertain of what is occurring to them. I welcome the fact, for example, that the government has introduced, or the previous government rather, I should remember that, introduced what was called a witness intermediary scheme to help witnesses who had speech and language problems, communication difficulties, to present their case better in court. But I do have to pose the question of why that assistance is not afforded to a defendant as well who may suffer from similar problems. Indeed, does a child's impairment increase the possibility of custody precisely because that impairment makes it more likely that they will fail to comply with a youth rehabilitation order or because there is a lack of an appropriate youth justice programme that might enable compliance. If that is the case, it is a damning indictment of the system. If eloquent children are more able to plead for one last chance, is that really our aim in society today? And when they get to custody, we have what are called the asset forms, the primary documents for interpreting the need of the children. They are critical to the development of appropriate care and sentence plans, yet they are structurally flawed. They fail to identify speech, language and communication difficulties. They impair identification of individual problems 
and make it harder to address those difficulties during the time in custody, however short or long it may be. The inadequacy of asset means under-reporting of these problems, and I believe a lack of their seriousness has been taken within public policy circles. One should also recognise that there have been improvements in how mental health has been addressed, thanks to the report by Lord Bradley. But even that is by no means perfect, and indeed it is only a success relative to the absolute failure in terms of other needs. And the consequences of this failure in screening and appropriate identification are severe. We are, as I said earlier, setting young offenders up to fail. And this manifests itself in the rapid increase in the numbers of young offenders who are returned to remand for breach of conditions. If, for example, you are given what is still currently an ASBO and told you cannot enter a particular road, yet your grandmother might live, might live on the other side of the road and you cross it to see your grandmother and somebody spots you and reports you for it, that is a breach. That might get you sent back to a young offender institution. Yet it would seem to me to be a technical breach. It might even be that the young person cannot comprehend that in order to get to their grandmothers, they will be breaching an ASBO in the first place. And if they do not receive appropriate care and an appropriate sentence plan, if they have a basic lack of understanding in the process they are engaged in, that they are incapable of engaging with the interventions provided for them, we are setting them up to fail, in my view. And then when they get to custody, well, it's the same story again, in my view. As Nick Hardwick, the Chief Inspector of Prisons, said, prisons can offer a short window of opportunity for the majority of young people who end up in custody. It is an opportunity that must not be wasted. But I do have concerns that it is being wasted in some instances. If we take the example of basic skills, literacy and numeracy, it is critical that children who have perhaps dropped out of the education system and have not acquired those skills are re-equipped with them if they are to fulfil a purposeful life once they are released. Yet in written answers to me from the Minister, it's been clear that the numbers who have um, gone through literacy qualifications has dropped from 2,104 in 2006-07 to just 1,350 in 2009-10. Similarly, those who go through numeracy courses have dropped from 2,680 in 0607 to 1,813 in 09-10. And I doubt that this is simply because of a decrease in the numbers in those institutions. There is something clearly more structural going on, and I would welcome some more information as to why that might be occurring. Of course I will, certainly. I'm very, very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman and... Uh, He's making a very, very good contribution indeed. Um, uh, in, in relation to the last point, uh, does he recognise, and I say this as a former Minister of Responsibility for Skills and Training in Prison, uh, that um, whilst uh, there are actually many young people making progress in our prisons, we were not able to bring forward schemes like Building Schools for the Future in prison so that facilities, I think, could be greatly improved. Uh, and indeed, does he agree with me, that it's really important that for young people on short sentences that the integration back into usually further education in the community is happening in a very real way? I thank the member for that contribution. And I think it raises a wider point about who owns the child when it is progressing through the criminal justice system. One of my concerns is that when you transfer from your home local authority into the secure estate, your home council effectively washes its hands of you. You may have been going through pupil referral units or educational diversity, as we call it in Blackpool, find yourself in a young offender institution, and it's almost like starting again. Then you are released, and yet again you are starting again when you return to your local authority. Once again, there is that lack of cohesion, in my view. Um, I would also like just to raise the issue of prison escort records when young offenders arrive at young offender institutions. I have been informed in a letter from the MOJ that the initial assessment of a prisoner's language skills is made by the custody manager who completes the escort record. Yet there has been no national review of the quality or accuracy of those reception language assessments. No obvious evidence that a tool is used which is approved by the professional bodies. Indeed, I do not believe we have enough speech and language therapists in custody. 
as an example at the Red Bank Secure Children's Home, where speech and language intervention reduced the need for physical restraints from two to three times a day to just two times per week. Yet only 15% of youth offending teens, for example, have access to speech and language therapy. And I have a particular concern that the changes to prison health care, the reassignment to the Department for Health, actually risks worsening prison health care. I am concerned, for example, that now that a, a primary care trust in the area where the young offender institution is located has to take responsibility for all the young offenders in that institution, it is causing problems over securing funding for the, for the health care within that institution. So I would ask the Minister if he could possibly comment on that and just explain why the change has occurred and how he hopes to protect those who are actually in the young offender institution and in need of quite specialist health provision that the primary care trust is now reluctant, it would appear, to fund. Um, I also think we need to provide more exits from this so-called conveyor belt in the community as well. I welcome the fact I mentioned earlier that we're trying to avoid the use of remand um, to custodial settings. And I support the concept, as I mentioned just now, of local authorities bearing more of the burden of responsibility for the cost of youth justice in their community. A child from Blackpool does not cease to be a child from Blackpool when he is in Hindley Young Offender Institution, for example. I know it's an idea raised in the recent Green Paper. Payment by results is also now a frequently cited intervention, yet I'm not sure it is fully yet understood. I would welcome some reassurance that these schemes on offer are not merely a case of helping the low-hanging fruit first to demonstrate that the, that, the, that the process works, that actually we focus on those who are perhaps hardest to help. Um, Lord Bradley's review, I mentioned earlier, recommended that all youth offending teams have a suitable qualified mental health worker who has responsibility for making appropriate referrals. And this is because um, CAMS, the Community and Adolescent Mental Health Services, are a particularly, I would suggest, malfunctioning part of our healthcare system. If you are 15 to 17 and you present for the first time with a mental health problem, the likelihood of CAMS taking you on is, I am afraid, pretty close to zero. Their view is that you will now have to wait to be dealt with by the adult mental health care system. That cannot be structurally what is intended by any government of any political persuasion. If you have a child in adolescent mental health service, it has the word adolescent in it, which surely applies to the age group 15 to 17. Also, I would like to focus on the issue of transitional services for children entering adulthood, a period for which there's no real age limit in my view, because Young people develop at different ages into adults. But I know that it will be covered in um, the Special Educational Needs Green Paper that's shortly coming. But I do hope that just as early intervention has been the public policy fad, if I can call it that, of the past decade, that the transition phase will become the fad of the coming decade because I think it has been sorely neglected with a very damaging impact, I think, on the quality of public policy in this country. We also, of course, have to consider the impact of arrangements for the release of young offenders. Um, I don't believe it is acceptable just to hand them a travel warrant and £46.75 upon their release. However, I have in the past suggested to the Minister that perhaps we increase that £46.75 to a higher figure because that surely isn't enough. And when I market tested that with the uh, professionals I met, it wasn't quite as supported as I thought it might be because the point was made that if you give them more money, cash in hand, you cannot actually control what they spend that money on. They would far rather focus on handing out vouchers that are allotted to specific needs that they will face in their first 48 hours or so rather than a cash payout. I just offer that as part of the minister's um, potential and that you've waited on for gentlemen. I thank uh, the honourable gentleman. I think he's making a very thoughtful uh, contribution. I just wonder whether he would agree with me that perhaps one of the most useful things that uh, can be given to young, young offenders when they're leaving an institution is somewhere to live mm -hmm. and actually ensuring that they have secure accommodation is perhaps uh, one of the best ways mm -hmm. of ensuring that uh, in, in the future they do not reoffend. I thank the honourable gentleman for that intervention. I think it's an example perhaps of our target culture that we measure 
the uh, number of young offenders on release who have accommodations um, available to them, but we do not measure the quality or sustainability of that accommodation. You can have an address to go to, but that might be someone's sofa. Yet, for the purposes of ticking the box, that sofa is regarded as a long-term solution. I don't believe it always is. I would like to briefly touch on the issue of dolly income tax, which is the uh, pretentious term for considering the age of criminal responsibility. And so I think I've given a great deal of thought to, because most in the criminal justice system do focus on the need to reduce our age of criminal responsibility down to, sorry, or to raise it rather, to the age of 14. Um, I've thought quite closely about this. There's clearly a humanitarian instinct lying at the root of this proposal. Yet my concern is that actually what we are discussing is nomenclature rather than outcomes. I realised at Barton Moss that many of the children that they look after in that setting, that secure setting behind a locked gate, are actually not there because they have entered the youth justice system. They are there because their councils have put them there for welfare reasons. So if we are to lower the age of criminal responsibility to 12 or 10 and say, and now we will allow the council's welfare department to look after them, the end result of that might be no different. Yet my very severe concern is that by leaving it to a council's welfare department and social services, you lose the many safeguards you actually have in the criminal justice system to ensure that the law is adhered to. And as we all know, after tragic case after tragic case, social services are becoming more risk averse in how they treat young people. That well-meaning recommendation might well have perverse consequences in my view, and I would argue strongly against it. Now, I think it's true that we should always celebrate every small progress that is made by a child. Merely attending two consecutive appointments can be a triumph for some. But we have to stress that the social, that the youth justice system, rather, is never the place to try to address all of society's ills, as tempting as it might be. It is perhaps a place that can be used to catch up, to address that which has been overlooked. But we have to start, as a nation, to accept that more must be done in the community. I realise that, that the Minister is shifting the Youth Justice Board back in-house, if you like. And I would welcome an assurance from him that youth justice will remain the responsibility of a separate unit within the Ministry of Justice, dedicated solely to the under-18s. The Youth Justice Board has issued many useful reports that have underlined the inadequacies of various stages of the youth justice process. And it would be a very great shame to lose that independent voice. It's still important that whoever we are, whatever our organisation, we still speak truth unto power. So I hope the civil servants who are responsible for youth justice do not recoil from speaking truth unto the minister where it is required. Equally, if all exit points from this convey about the crime I keep referring to are bottlenecked around the secure estate, it does risk still being a dumping ground for all the children whose problems cannot really be accommodated within society at the moment. In my view, they should be accommodated within society. We should be able to cope with those who have complexity of need. This is a damning indictment to this country that in order to address those problems, what we have to do is send them to a secure estate to lock them away, away from society, to say that society doesn't want to have to deal with those problems. I have been appalled at some of the populism I have heard in political debate about criminal justice in this House. It, great, it deeply disappoints me. The dignity of the individual, I believe, is compromised by many of the conditions in the youth justice system. The victim, as well, fails to receive satisfaction. I think that's a crucial word, satisfaction, because in my view, punishment has two elements, retribution and satisfaction. Retribution, in my view, comes in the form of incarceration. It is the deprivation of liberty and freedom. It is why the victim receives recompense for the crimes done to them. But satisfaction, in my view, is just as important because satisfaction is why there is recompense for the wider community whose laws have been offended. And the key part of satisfaction is that we reduce the likelihood of reoffending. that when that young person leaves the youth justice system, they are less likely to reoffend and more likely to have a purposeful life within that community 
whose laws they offended in the first place. And if our youth justice system makes it more likely that the most vulnerable receive the harshest punishments, then I believe we as a nation must examine our consciences. To my mind, community solutions at the appropriate moment are the way forward. Yet equally, I recognise that to be done properly, they must be intensive with the costs up front. And they are expensive, and I do recognise that. But as the Audit Commission report in 2004 made clear, if only one in ten of those who enter the youth justice system are catered for properly, the savings to the public purse could be as much as 100 million. And we are back again to the old argument that early intervention does save money and that that requires ambition on the part of ministers and the bravery to take decisions while the costs are up front but the benefits are long term. And I urge the minister to continue on his uh, well-meaning path towards trying to improve the youth justice system. Thank you very much.